I've been given the task this morning of addressing you on the theme, Be Ye Holy, as I am holy. And as I was listening to Don Carson uh, last night, I got a little nervous. It's one of those things that being almost the last speaker, uh, it's always a nerve-wracking uh, event because you're always terrified that somebody's going to steal your text. <laughs> and uh, when I heard uh, Dr. Carson uh, say last night that his text was going to be from First Peter, my heart stopped for a second or so. But he was in chapter 2, and I'm going to be in chapter 1. And I'm going to read from First Peter chapter 1, uh, beginning at verse 13 through to the end of the chapter, and it'll become obvious in a minute why it is I've selected uh, this particular text. Before I read the passage, let's look to, Lord, to the Lord in prayer. Lord our God, we thank You for the Scriptures that holy men of old wrote as they were carried along by the Holy Spirit that all Scripture is given by the outbreathing of God and is profitable for doctrine and reproof and correction and instruction in the way of righteousness, that the man of God might be thoroughly furnished unto every good work. Come, Holy Spirit, help us to read, mark, learn, and inwardly digest and all for Jesus' sake. Amen. Now, this is God's holy, inerrant Word. Therefore, preparing your minds for action and being sober-minded, set your hope fully on the grace that will be brought to you at the revelation of Jesus Christ. As obedient children, do not be conformed to the passions of your former ignorance, but as He who called you is holy, you also be holy in all your conduct. Since it is written, you shall be holy, for I am holy. And if you call on him as Father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourselves with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ, like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. He was foreknown before the foundation of the world, but was made manifest in the last times for the sake of you, who through him are believers in God who raised Him from the dead and gave Him glory, so that your faith and hope are in God, having purified your souls by your obedience to the truth for a sincere brotherly love. Love one another earnestly from a pure heart, since you have been born again, not of perishable seed, but of imperishable, through the living and abiding Word of God. For all flesh is like grass, and all its glory like the flower of grass. The grass withers, and the flower falls, but the Word of the Lord 
remains forever. And this word is the good news that was preached to you. Amen. May God bless to us that reading of His holy and inerrant word. It's one thing to talk about the holiness of God, and it's another thing to desire holiness for ourselves. Holiness is an essential aspect of the Christian life. Think of Luther's great stress on a faith that produces works. Or think of Calvin in his institutes, the third use of the law, the tertius usus legus, as a guide for sanctification. Or think of the Westminster Confession of Faith, that we are justified by faith alone, but that faith that justifies is not alone, it is always accompanied by works. But we live in such a man-centered age. We live in such a man-centered church. We live for self-fulfillment rather than pleasing God. We like books on how to be a good father, or how to be a successful lover, or how to improve your diet, rather than books that explain to us how we should be holy and how we should be Christ-like. And sometimes I think in our own circles, if I can address ourselves for a minute, we can be so concerned and easily concerned about theological issues and miss the point, and miss the point that the point of all theology is to drive us into a Christ-likeness, into a holiness of life. It's been cited already in the last few days, Robert Murray McShane's great statement. He lived until he was 29. He was only in the ministry for seven years. At least one of those years, he was in Palestine forming what would become a mission to the Jews. My people's greatest need he was speaking, of course, as a minister. He was speaking as a gospel preacher. My people's greatest need is what? My personal holiness. It's a serious business. It's a serious business because, as the author of Hebrews puts it, without holiness, no man shall see the Lord. Look at our text with me, and you see there in verse 13 the word therefore. And as preachers are wont to say, when you see the word therefore, you must ask the question, what is the therefore there for? And it's there because it is introducing us to gospel grammar. That is, that Peter wants to address the issue of holiness. He wants to address the issue of sanctification. He wants to say some very specific things in the course of this letter, but he's basing those moral, ethical imperatives upon gospel indicatives. Now, confuse those two, and you confuse the gospel. Confuse sanctification and justification, and you confuse everything. And Peter, in the opening section of his epistle, has already introduced us to certain indicatives, certain things that are true about us as the people of God, as those who have come to faith in Jesus Christ. You notice in the opening two verses of chapter 1, he has addressed those elect 
exiles of the dispersion of Pontus, Galatia, Cappadocia, Asia, and Bithynia, what we would think of today as Asia Minor or Turkey. And according to, note, the foreknowledge of God the Father in the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. Already at the outset of this epistle, he's introduced the goal of this letter. He wants us to see that in the plan and purpose of God, in the whole scheme of the plan of redemption from foreordination, from foreknowledge, from the secret counsels of God in eternity until the very last day, God's plan and purpose is the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ. We are saved to be holy. We are justified by faith in order that we might reflect something of the holiness of God of which we've been hearing. You notice, you notice there in verse 2 how Trinitarian Peter is. He mentions the foreknowledge of God the Father and the sanctification of the Spirit for obedience to Jesus Christ and for sprinkling with His blood. It's as though the Father is looking down the corridors of, of history and has already set His love on this one and that one, and He turns to the Holy Spirit and says, in my love I want this one to become mine. And the Holy Spirit taps on this person's shoulders and says, the Father wants you. And the Spirit takes that person to Jesus Christ and says to the Son, this one wants you to become his prophet and his priest and his king. And Jesus says to this person, come and meet my Father because it was his plan all along. Now what is it that Peter has said? And he said three things. He says that we have been called to a living hope and an indescribable inheritance and to an inexpressible joy. That's, that's what we are as those who have been drawn by the Spirit into union and communion with Jesus Christ. We have a living hope and we have an indescribable inheritance and we have an inexpressible joy in Jesus Christ. And on the basis of that, of what you now are in Jesus Christ, be holy, be sanctified, be Christ-like. Notice the relationship between the indicative and the imperative. He's not calling upon us to be holy in order that we might be saved, but on the basis that we are already in union with Christ, that we are already the redeemed of the Lord. Now as a consequence, on the basis of that, be holy. You note in verse 13, and it's counterintuitive in our age, I think. You notice what Peter says, therefore, preparing your minds for action. Gird up the loins of your mind in the old King James Version. Back in 1972 or 1973, I picked up a little booklet. It was written by John Stott. And the opening sentence of that book read something like this, the major secret of holy living lies in the what? It's a little quiz. It's a little test. The major secret of holy living lies in the mind. In the mind. It begins in our minds. It begins with how we think. It begins with an epistemological repentance. 
It begins with changing our minds about certain things and having our minds addressed by the Word of God. Gird up the loins of your mind. Begin to think in Christian ways, in biblical ways. Not long after that, in 1974, I think it was, I was introduced to John Owen. I stayed for about a year or so in the manse of uh, Jeffrey Thomas, uh, the Reformed Baptist preacher in Alfred Place in Aberystwyth, where he has been now for almost 45 years. And I was uh, a young Christian. I'd only been converted a couple of years, and I was living in his uh, manse on the third floor, and he decided that one of the things that I needed most was to get up early, and I think it was around five o'clock in the morning, and uh, the two of us would drink uh, very strong coffee, black, no sugar, and we read together volume seven of John Owen on spiritual mindedness. Uh, John Owen can be prolix. Uh, John Owen believed in the philosophy, why say something in a hundred words when you can take a thousand? <laughs> and I remember writing in the margins of my volume seven of John Owen little notes at five or five thirty in the morning, incomprehensible notes now as I go back and look at them. But I do remember this one statement that John Owen made. Actually, it was a question. What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything in particular? What do you think about when you're not thinking about anything in particular? What is the default setting of your mind? What do you revert to? when you're not being forced to go in a certain direction. And that, John Owen says, is the indicator of your spiritual mindedness. It is the indicator of your holiness. Now, Peter is saying here, gird up the loins of your mind. Begin to think in biblical categories and biblical terms. And he sets before us here a number of motivations for holiness. And I want us to explore uh, three or four of these motivations this morning. The first is the holiness of God. The holiness of God. You note, of course, there in verses 15 and 16, he cites the text that comes from the book of Leviticus, several places in the book of Leviticus, the so-called holiness code, you shall be holy for I am holy. Giving to us a motivation for holiness and perhaps also a standard for holiness. That because God is holy, because the Father is holy, because the Son is holy, because the Holy Spirit is holy, He wants His people to be holy. Because we have been drawn into a relationship with this God. He is our Creator who made us in order that we might reflect His holiness, who recreated us, regenerated us who has quickened us through the instrumentality of the Word and through the Gospel and has brought us to the feet of Jesus Christ and we've embraced Him by faith and called Him prophet, priest, and king. And all that we might be holy, that we might be sanctified, that we might be set apart, that we might reflect something of His moral purity and integrity. How could it be otherwise that the Creator God and Recreator God would not want us, you and I, this morning to be a holy people? 
set apart for God, living out and out for God, putting God first in every aspect of our lives. Turn with me just for a second or two to the book of 1 Samuel and chapter 1. And I take you here because this is where I've been in the last few weeks, reflecting on the opening chapters of Samuel. And I want to explore just for a second the parameters of holiness in which Hannah herself was motivated to be holy by a consideration of the holiness of God. You're introduced to this little family, Elkanah and Hannah, whom Elkanah loved. But there's another woman. There's Penina. Elkanah has two wives, and alarm bells are going off in your mind. There are problems here. There are significant problems here. And as you read the chapter, you remember that Hannah has no children and seemingly can't have children. But Penina is having children as often as fruit drops off the trees in the fall. And she knows it. And on visits to the temple in Bethel, Panina, snooty little thing that she appears to be, <laughs> rubs it in. You can imagine a conversation in the house of Panina with her children, and her children are saying, why does Auntie Hannah not have children? And Panina says, well, I don't know, but why don't you go and ask her? <laughs> but I think God has cursed her. And you remember when she gets to the temple, on the journey there, she, she's, she's off her food, she's, she's crying, she's, she's, she's weeping. She, she's a woman in, in spiritual torment and trial. And Hannah hears her husband, Elkanah, who has read how to be a good husband, saying to her, why are you crying? Why are you off your food? Am I not worth more to you than ten sons? What an oaf. <laughs> and do you remember when Hannah gets to the temple and Eli the priest, she's praying, you remember? And words are coming out, but they're not, there's no sound. She's, she's vocalizing, but her mouth is moving, but there's no sound. And Eli, who's been reading the same journal about male sensitivity as Elkanah, says, <laughs> you're drunk, woman. <laughs> Hannah does one of the most incredible things in 1 Samuel chapter 1. It has moved me uh, beyond description in the last couple of weeks as I've thought about it. She, she prays a prayer. Do you know what her prayer was? Lord, give to me, and I will give him back to you. That, that was her prayer. In, in the midst of her trial, in the midst of her pain, in the midst of her difficulty. And remember, in First Peter, Peter is writing to a, a church that's facing trial. He's writing probably in the mid to late 60s with the onset of, of Roman persecution coming upon the church, and he's preparing them for the day of trial, and what he wants them to see is that in the day of trial, they must learn to be holy because God is holy. 
Now, if you turn to 1 Samuel, look at chapter 2 and verse 2. Now, notice in chapter 2, Hannah sings that glorious song. It's the song that Mary almost cites verbatim in the Magnificat, you remember. And look at what she says in verse 2. There is none holy like the Lord. There is none besides you. What was it that enabled Hannah to reflect that sheer consecrated spirit, to pray that selfless prayer, Lord, give to me, and I will give him back to you. And when Samuel is, what, three or four, when he's been weaned, she takes him to Shiloh, and she leaves him there. Can you, can you even imagine what that would be like? Can you imagine the selflessness of it, denying herself, denying her self-interest? It was the holiness of God. It was the holiness of God that shaped and molded the pattern of her holy living. Don't you think that that's what Peter is talking about here? When he's preparing these Christians to face the onset of trial and difficulty, maybe you're saying this morning, you see, and in an audience of this size, there must be many of you here today facing unimaginable trials and unimaginable difficulties. And maybe the question that you're asking is, how in the world can I be holy when I've got this trial? Lord, take this trial away in order that I might be holy. And God is saying to you this morning, this is the reason why the trial is here. It is to make you holy. It is to bring you to an end of yourself. It is for you to capture that there is nothing in this world that can attract you and that you must be attracted to the beauty. And yes, Psalm 29 speaks about the beauty of holiness. There's an intimidation to holiness. There's a purity to holiness. There's a separation to holiness. But there's a beauty of holiness too. In Isaiah 6, there's a an attraction, and there's a fascination, and there's a repulsion too. And don't you think that Peter is saying here, in the context of the oncoming trial, in the midst of your pain, in the midst of your difficulty, in the midst of the horrendousness of it, only God can fully satisfy because it was by Him you were made, and it was by Him that you were remade in Jesus Christ. Be holy, because God is holy. Now, I think it's all too easy for us to talk about the holiness of God, and to read Dr. Sproul's magnificent exposition of the holiness of God, and to have that on our bookshelf to have it on the sill of our car, to carry it around as an emblem of our reformed status. But God is interested in the state of our hearts and in the state of our souls. And He's saying to you and He's saying to me this morning, I want you to be holy. And I want to ask you as we bring this conference almost to a close and as we expect Dr. Sproul's final address to us this afternoon, is that my passionate concern this morning? Is that my overwhelming concern this morning? Is that the one thing that I long for and pray for? and yearn for more than anything else in all the world. I want to be holy. I want to be a holy people. I want my church to be holy. 
I want to be known as somebody who is Christ-like, self-denying as Jesus was. But there's a second motivation here, and that is the gospel. And you see that expounded in verses 17 through 21. That reverent obedience is evoked here. If you call on him as father who judges impartially according to each one's deeds, conduct yourself with fear throughout the time of your exile, knowing that you were ransomed from the futile ways inherited from your forefathers, not with perishable things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Christ like that of a lamb without blemish or spot. And Peter seems to be saying at least two things here. He's saying that the motivation of the gospel is first of all depicted for us by the language and significance of redemption. That we were bought, that we were purchased by the blood of Jesus Christ as of a lamb without spot or blemish. You and I, as believers in Jesus Christ, have been bought. We have been purchased. We are not our own. And Peter is meditating, I think, as he so often did, on that incident at Caesarea Philippi in Matthew 16. Who do men say that I am? And some said that he was Elijah, and some Jeremiah, and others some other prophet. But who do you say that I am? And do you remember it was Peter, this Peter, who said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And and Jesus went on, you remember, to say and to speak clearly that he must now needs go to Jerusalem and there to be handed over to the scribes and Pharisees and to be crucified and on the third day rise again. And remember Peter in response to the thought that, that his Savior must die and shed his blood in Jerusalem uttered those two words that can never go together in the same sentence, Lord, never, Lord, You must be mistaken. Lord, you who are the sovereign king of kings, this can never happen to you. And I think Peter must have reflected on that passage, not least because of the words that Jesus went on to say that you are Peter and on this rock I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. You know, it's often said, isn't it, that all of Western civilization is just a series of footnotes on Plato and Aristotle. And in a sense, all of the New Testament is just a series of footnotes on those words of Jesus at Caesarea Philippi. And I think what dawned on Peter that day, and I think it dawned on him for many a day thereafter, was that the blood of Jesus had actually purchased him and bought him so that he was no longer his own, and that the blood of Jesus had redeemed him from the futile ways, the empty way of life, from the vanity of this world. But not only did Peter see, I think here, the gospel logic that we are bought. And you know, when you are bought, when you purchase something, when you own something, you have the right to use that in a way that pleases you. It's called the right of private ownership, which we almost still have. (laughs) It's a precious, precious truth. And I think Peter is reflecting here on the fact that my holiness is motivated by the fact that I am not my own. I belong to another. I belong to my Savior, Jesus Christ. I have been purchased by Him. He has shed His blood for me. 
paid the ransom price to set me free. But you notice he goes on in verses 20 and 21 to reflect on the revelation of the gospel because he was foreknown from before the foundation of the world but was made manifest in these last times for the sake of you who through him are believers in God who raised him from the dead and gave him glory so that your faith and hope are in God. This is, this is what the gospel is all about, Peter is saying. You see what he's saying? That if we are to be holy, that holiness of ours is fundamentally related to all that God has done in the purposes of redemption in sending the Lord Jesus Christ into the world to become incarnate, to die on the cross, to rise again for our justification. It's Abraham Kuyper who says in his book on the Holy Spirit that what the redeemed soul needs is human holiness, not God's holiness, not angelic holiness, but human holiness, not in the Father and not in the Holy Spirit, but in the humanity of Jesus Christ, so that the author of Hebrews can say in Hebrews chapter 2 that the one who sanctifies and those who are sanctified are one and the same. We share in the holiness of Jesus Christ. We are in progressive sanctification to reflect that righteousness of Christ that has been reckoned and imputed to us by faith in Jesus Christ. And the way he does that is first of all to bring us into gospel union with Jesus Christ. So that in Paul's language and way of putting it is that we are in Christ. We have believed into Jesus Christ. Or as Peter will say it in the second chapter, we are stones. Isn't it interesting? The one to whom Jesus addressed as a rock, that every time Peter saw a rock or a stone or a pebble, he couldn't think anything other than the fact that we are living stones in a temple in which Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We are in a building of God where Jesus Christ is the chief cornerstone. We are to be holy because we have been brought by faith into a living and vital relationship with Jesus Christ. Now notice also here that there's another motivation. He tells us that we are children, and if we call on Him, he says in verse 17, as a father. What a, what a privilege that is. We, we have… We have been brought into a relationship in which, in which we can call God, this holy God, this, this righteous God, we can call Him Abba, Father. We are the children of God. We've been brought into the family of God. That, that's why I think He goes on in this passage in verse uh, twenty. Uh, two, to speak about loving one another because we are to be conscious that as Christians we've been brought into a family. I remember when I was converted in 1971, I wasn't raised in a Christian home, I never went to church as a boy, never read the Bible, didn't possess a copy, couldn't have told you what was in the Bible. I remember the first occasion as a young Christian who'd been suddenly converted through reading a book, walking into a church, a Reformed Baptist church, 
seeing men and women carrying Bibles and talking about Jesus. And I remember I'd been raised in somewhat of a dysfunctional family. I remember thinking then a thought that has never gone away. This is my family. These are my mothers and fathers and brothers and sisters and wives and husbands. These are my people. Don't you sense that when you come to a Ligonier conference? These are my people. We share the same interests. We share the same goals. We read the same books. We talk about the same things. We have the same interests. We're so boring. <laughs> and Peter is addressing holiness within the context of family life. Remember that you're in the family of God now. When I was in high school, oh, I don't know, I was 12 or 13. My older brother was 17. And you know when you're in your teens, four years can be like 50 years. You know, when you're 12 and your older brother is 17, he might as well have been 48. <laughs> and I, I did something in high school. You know, it was something that, that high school kids do. It, and it's not important what it was, and it's none of your business. <laughs> but I got into trouble. I got into trouble with the headmaster. I was punished by the headmaster. I was caned by the headmaster when it was legal to do so. But that was nothing. It was lunchtime when my 17-year-old older brother caught me in the corridor of the high school, pulled me aside, took me out, literally behind the woodshed, a shed that held sports equipment. And behind the woodshed, he, he uttered these words. They've never gone away from me. You've let the family down. It was like some Sicilian mafia boss. <laughs> this was Wales, you understand. But I'd let the family down. This is Peter's motivation here love one another from a pure heart, with sincerity, with affection, because we are members of the family of God. And when you sin, when you fall short of God's glory, you let the family down. You let your father down. It's a test, isn't it, of our love for our Heavenly Father? Is holiness my overwhelming desire and aspiration? Now, there are other motivations here, not least in verse 17, the idea of the judgment of God, and I don't have time to expand on that. Just to say this, whatever happened to the judgment of God in evangelical churches? Whatever happened to the notion that for the redeemed of the Lord there will be a judgment according to works? That we must give an account of all the deeds that we've done in the body? That there are rewards in the new heavens and in the new earth. Somewhere in the evangelical church in the last 20 or 30 years, the idea of egalitarianism has crept into our concept of the new heavens and the new earth. But my friends, that's not what the New Testament seems to me to be teaching here. One of the motivations for holiness is that we must give an account, that there's a day of 
reckoning coming. Peter's concern for holiness here is in the midst of fiery trials. I can't close this morning without at least addressing that particular issue. Is that where you are t- this morning, passing through a particular trial, a horrendous difficulty in your marriage, in work, with your children, with yourself? And Peter would be saying to you this morning, I want you to see that. I want you to see that trial as God's gift to you. Embrace it. Don't waste your cancer, as John Piper says. Don't waste your trial. But see it in the purposes of our sovereign God as the very means to conform you to the image of His Son, that you might be able to say with Job that when I am tried, I will come forth as gold. Can I quote Charles Wesley? From love divine, all loves excelling. Finish then thy new creation, pure and spotless, let us be. Let us see thy great salvation perfectly restored in thee, changed from glory unto glory, till in heaven we take our place, till we cast our crowns before thee, lost in wonder, love, and praise. Be holy, you shall be holy, for I am holy, God says. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you now for your word, but we are humbled, though insufficiently, by the thought that we are still, even as the redeemed of the Lord, an unholy people. The good that we would, we do not, and the evil that we would not, that we find that we do, O wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from the body of this death? But we thank you for the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, who, having begun a good work, will complete it unto the day of Christ. So grant us that holiness without which no man shall see the Lord, and we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.